Hello Maya students, welcome to the lighting tutorial. We're going to learn how to create and position different types of lights, edit the attributes of those lights, and experiment with their effects in the scene, and cast shadows on the different surfaces using the lights and objects in your scene. Now, um, lighting in 3D does not work the way it does in the real world. Lights in Maya will, um, by, by default, they will hit a surface and stop. They will go to infinity, and then whenever they hit a, an object, they will stop. So there's no bouncing of light <coughs> with, the, with the basic, um, with all the basic lights and the uh, ray tracing, there's no bouncing of lights. Um, in this lesson, we're going to learn how to control the four most common light types, ambient, directional, point, and spotlight. And um, what we're going to learn is how to simulate, that's an important word, simulate real-world lighting. One of the most important things you need to do from here on out with every project is turn off default lighting. Once you have lights in your scene, it can interfere with your lighting scheme. So um, now usually it turns itself off when you add a light, but I'm going to open it up and make sure that it's gone when we start lighting. And that will make everything just black. Even though there are no lights in the scene, the scene is being lit with the default lighting scheme. Maya automatically detects this and creates a temporary default lighting setup in your scene just before you render. The feature can be turned off by clicking enable default light under the render settings. And that is down at the bottom under render options. It's right there. We're going to come back to that. Okay, so I'm going to set my project folder to the Unit 6 demo files, lights, cameras, no action now. And I'm going to open lights.ma. Okay, and this gives us a little something to play with. Now, um, we're going to start with ambient light. Ambient light simulates shading, uh, simulates lighting being emitted evenly across the entire scene, inwards from all directions. And it's usually used to um, create the look of an indirect lighting, like an in indoor bounce light or um, something like that. Now, you'll notice at the beginning of the tutorial on the um, um, in the text, it got it has some tips from Alan Chan. One of which is to never have your ambient light above five percent or fifteen percent at the most. Fifteen percent is for like outdoors. So um, let me create under rendering. The first one is the ambient light. It looks like a sun because that's sort of what it's like. It's like a sun. The ambient light is light from everywhere. It does not matter where in the world this icon is. It doesn't matter which way it's pointed or what size it is. Other lights, um, their position might matter, but their rotation and size do not. Other lights, their position does not matter, but their rotation and size does, and, and so on. With the ambient light, none of it matters. It doesn't matter where it is or how big it is, or how it's rotated. It's not going to change anything about the ambient light. Now under the intensity, it's at 100% right now. And we're going to take that down quite a bit. Let's pretend this is a daytime outdoor scene, and we'll set it to 15%, 0.15. And you can create color on your lights anytime you want. 
So if you want it to have a little bit of color, you can do that. Okay, and let's do a quick render. And you can see that the default light has turned off. So if I keep this image, I can delete that light and do another render and you'll see it with the default lights. And that's what it looks like with the default lights. Obviously a very clear difference. So generally the default lights will turn off the moment you introduce any light into the scene at all. But I would like you to go into your render settings and turn it off in this scene and all future scenes. Turn off default light. Okay, you'll notice in the rendering that a an ambient light gives off very little actual light. So um, clearly the scene is very dark and that is normal for an ambient light. That's what you want to be happening with your ambient light. It should just be contributing a little bit of light to the scene. Um, so directional lights simulate light sources that are distant and have parallel light rays. Usually the sun is a good example. Such a light is usually so large and strong that it lights your scene evenly from every direction. Select create lights directional light. Sorry, my mouse is a little wiggly. Take the sensitivity down a little bit. And that creates our directional light here. And this one is going to react to which way you turn it, which way you rotate it. I like to scale these up, not because it matters, but it just helps me work with them. So late in the day, you might see the sun rays coming in like that, or midday, something more like that. I'm going to frame up on these buildings too here. And I'm also going to change to wireframe view on the orthographic views. expecting to see exactly. Let's give it a color just to I want to see what it's contributing to the scene. Okay, it's lighting that but not that. That's strange. Um, I'm going to convert these to polygons. Modify, convert, and paint effects to polygons. I'm going to select these. Modify, convert, paint effects to polygons. And I think that covers all of them. I'm going to turn on lighting. So this is lighting, this is textures, and this is shadows. I'm going to turn all of them on.
for the perspective view. Yeah, okay, the conversion to polygons did it. There was some kind of weirdness. Not sure about the spires either, but maybe select the spires and do a convert paint effects to polygons. Okay, whatever, I don't care. Um, I'm going to select that directional light again, and again, if you lose track of it, go to Windows Outliner, and here's the two lights that we created. And sunlight is going to be a little bit more golden. I go, I go a little bit on the white side with sunlight, so it's kind of got an ivory color to it. And that usually works pretty well for me. The intensity is at 100%. The intensity can go above 100%. And that is usually something that you don't want for a light with no decay. And this light has no decay. So you probably don't want to go above 100%. Sunlight, um, depending on the time of the day, like when it's high in the sky, it's probably going to be around 99%. When it's lower in the sky, if you want to try that, um, it's probably going to be a lower percentage, like that. So that changes how it how it uh, contributes to the scene as well. Now you can see that there are shadows being cast from these objects and when we render it, it does not actually cast shadows. That's because you have to turn shadows on with each light that you create. And usually um, what you want is depth map shadows. The other option is ray trace shadows. I'm going to turn off ray trace shadows and turn on depth map shadows. The resolution starts off kind of low. You can take that up if you want. And these shadows will show up in the render. The ray trace shadows will not show up unless you turn on ray tracing in the render options, which we'll do that, we'll do that in a bit. But um, shadow maps are quicker and easier for the computer to figure out. What it does is it just generates a bitmap an image, in other words. Uh, it figures out which way the light is pointing, um, where the object it's hitting, and where um, where the next object after that, you know, where the shadow would fall. So, in other words, the light rays are hitting the buildings, and then the shadow falls on this plane down here that represents the ground, sort of. And then it draws an image in perspective back to the source of the light and what you get is this this shadow and that works for a lot of stuff the the one downside of it is that it's completely opaque so one thing it does not work for is a transparent object okay I am going to hide that light with control H and that will make it, when it's hidden, it is not going to contribute light to the scene. And I'm going to go to Create Lights, and the next one down is Point Light. Point Lights, uh, only their position matters. The size isn't going to change anything. The rotation isn't going to change anything. Point Lights emit light in all directions from the central center point. Um, let's move the light to the coordinates of negative 1, 4, 16. And that gives us an interesting kind of cast shadow there. So it's kind of between the buildings. 
and I am going to I'm going to go to the attribute editor. Um, your point light is going to be more like a light bulb, and indoor lights should almost always have a decay. And don't worry about what these mean too much, but linear is the first step of decay, and then the next one is quadratic, and that one falls off basically um, faster than linear, and cubic falls off faster than that. So you can see that the light is falling away as it gets further away, whereas if you've got no decay, the light does not reduce in, in intensity as it moves away from the central point. So I'm going to turn on linear, and this is where the intensity of higher than 100% comes in. So almost all of your indoor lights should have a fall off. And I'm going to turn on depth map shadows and turn off ray trace shadows just in case it's on. And then I'll render that. And as you can see, these lights don't, you don't see the actual light itself. What you see is the effects of the presence of that light. So the light's right about here in this scene, but you don't see it. You just see where it's casting light onto the objects. Okay, so let's hide that. And we will create a spotlight now. These are all right here in the shelf as well. Um, but I do like to show multiple ways to do things, first of all. And second of all, ambient light and point light can be really easy to get mixed up. And you do not want to be creating an ambient light with, with a super high intensity. It's going to flatten your scene out. It's not what ambient lights are for. Ambient lights should be at a temp, uh, an intensity of 0.15 at the highest, and that's for outdoors. Um, for indoors, maybe 0 0.05, you know, 5% intensity, or lower, or just not present. Spotlights can be used to simulate lights like theater lights and desk lamps. Um, they are a lot like point lights in the sense that they emit light from a single point. But the difference is there's a cutoff. So you've got like a cone that comes out. And you can widen that cone with the cone angle over here. And you can soften the edge, which I highly recommend you do. because it looks really crummy. So play with these settings and soften up the light. Let's hide that point light too. I meant to do that. Play with these lights. Don't just accept the defaults. It's not going to look good that way. And just for kicks, so I'll give it a color. Uh, in addition, you can also give these an image, just like anything else. There's that image texture again. And um, if you were to put some kind of image on there, it will project that image. So like, for example, a fractal. Um, and this might not necessarily show up in the uh, preview, but it'll show up in the render view. So there it is with it projecting a fractal image. Um, and that makes uh, that makes for some interesting visuals and opens up a lot from your toolkit. So um, if you want to, you can go look for gobo lights and you will find stuff that you can um, maybe gobo light stencil. All these things, these are made for projection lights. And you can stick them on your um, spotlight and create
create like a projection out of that. Um, let's try a more generic search term. You're not looking for the projected light, you're looking for just the image to project. So, um, stuff like this and this. Yeah, I'm not getting what I was hoping to get here, but... Let's try Gobo Texture. That's closer to what I'm looking for. So you can project a lot of different images and create um, a lot of different effects. Um, for example, underwater lighting is a good uh, good use of gobo lights. Um, so yeah, play with those images. Okay, so Let's hide the spotlight and let's create the last one on the list. Let's create an area light. Area lights are like pretty much like a fluorescent overhead light. Um, they're good for they're good for that, and they also act a lot like a. Um, like a uh, like a light kit, like those big boxes that you see. Like this would be the front, the projection part, and those will um, those will respond to positioning, rotation, and also size. They will get more intense the bigger they they are. So one of the things I also like about area lights is that they project a nice even light. And it makes it makes a real soft shadow, which you can't get soft shadows from a depth map shadow, but we can filter it a little bit more and soften it up a little bit. So it's better than nothing. But only a ray trace shadow will give you a soft, an actual soft shadow. Uh, but this is an area light and I like them for indoor lighting and anything that you might want to use for studio lighting. So uh, for example a three-point light setup is it's good to have at least one area light in my opinion. I usually like to use it as the key light and then the kick light I make a point light. That's not what you don't have to follow that but um, it's something you can do. Okay, I'm going to clear this scene out and we're going to talk about ray tracing. Ray tracing provides accurate reflections, refractions, and shadows, both transparent and soft shadows. These effects are achieved by the renderer which shoots rays into the scene from the light source. These rays gather certain information which can be used to create some more photorealistic effects. However, ray tracing is computationally intensive and it is suggested that you only use it when you really need to for a particular effect. So with great power comes great render time. Let's open up the scene called ray tracing. And that is not a problem. This is probably not a problem. I'm not going to worry about it. And I'm going to just show the perspective view. This scene shows us a couple of bottles sitting on a desk 
in the background of this um, checkerboard room thing. And if you render that, you will see just that. And neither of these look like very realistic glass. Um, let's open an IPR render and I'm going to draw a box around the flasks and I'm going to go into my render settings and let's go to the Maya software tab and I want to make sure that my um, quality is on the highest quality 3D motion blur production and usually the defaults are fine for the rest of this stuff. Uh, under ray tracing quality, we're going to turn on ray tracing. And 10 rays is a lot. Let's close that. I thought that IPR would refresh, but let's click refresh here. Oh, IPR does not support ray tracing. Okay. I did not know that. So we'll just render it one at a time and let's click keep image. So we certainly see some changes here in comparison to the first one. Uh, I would not call this um, anything that looks like um, what we want, but you can see that it's different. Um, Let's minimize that and select this flask. I, I said glass. This is actually supposed to be metal. So let's call this chrome. And we're going to take a look at this, this guy's attributes. Uh, the flask has a blend material assigned to it, which simulates shiny surfaces and allows reflections, and it makes good metal. You can verify whether a material supports reflections by seeing if it has the reflectivity attribute. This will show you how reflective, this will let you set how reflective an object is. Again, this only works if you turn on ray tracing in your render settings up here. So um, I'm going to put that on 0.9 and that'll make a good chrome. Um, I'm going to change the color to a pale, mostly grayish blue, maybe a little more in the realm of cyan. And let's put it on a low diffuse. It's already at 0.17, so that's pretty good. Eccentricity should come up a little bit. We want that specular highlight a little bigger. And I don't think specular roll off really even needs to change. Specular color, uh, we're going to change that to a very light pale blue. Just, just barely a little bit in there. It's a subtle effect. And then if we render that, we should see something that looks more like a chrome effect. So you can see quite a difference there. Okay, now let's select the glass. And I, I want to talk about refraction a little bit. Refraction is, is what happens when light bends. And light will bend in real life whenever it passes through uh, glass or water or a number of other materials. Transparent surfaces um, are something you probably don't pay very much attention to. That is, until the time comes to realistically model and render one in Maya. Now, the first thing we need to do is to better understand how transparency works. The transparent surface will bend the light, and that's called refraction. Every transparent surface bends the light to some extent, some more than others. 
So that's when you, if you put a straw into a glass of water, it has a, an appearance that is sort of broken. And that's also what makes a diamond sparkle, and that's why lenses help correct our vision. So what happens in real life, if you think about it, a ray starts out traveling through the air, which is a refraction of one, and then hits the glass, which is a refraction of 1.33, and that bends the ray. It travels through the glass to the other side, back out into air, where it is no longer refracting. And that's what we're going to try to simulate here. So far the glass doesn't look very convincing. That's because real glass refracts light. The refraction index is at about um, 1.333. It's about the same for water too. So let's open up the ray tracing tab and we're going to turn on refractions and set the index to 1.333. And the reflectivity, we're going to set that at about 0.25. So take it down a little, little bit. Okay, and then when we render this, it's going to look quite a bit different now. So now it's looking like a glass. Oops, let me keep that render. I'm going to click the keep button right there, keep the render. And I want to go to my outliner and select my point light. And under the attributes, I'm going to turn on the ray trace shadows. And one shadow ray might not quite do it. I think I'm going to do three shadow rays with a depth limit of four. And we'll see how that looks. Um, let's actually turn that off for a moment and turn on depth map shadows so I can show you something. And I can just quickly render. Because the depth map shadows render pretty quickly. so. I'm going to keep that, and you can see the shadow on the chrome looks fine, but the shadow on the glass does not. Um, this You would not see an opaque shadow coming through from a transparent glass. That doesn't make sense. And that's the limitation of depth map shadows, is they, they can't do well in that situation. So if you turn on ray trace shadows, um, that's going to allow you to create soft shadows as they appear um, in real life coming through transparent objects and they get softer as they fade away from the object, as they fall away from the object. So obviously quite a difference. It's the same for this object because it's opaque, but clearly we can see quite a difference in the glass jar. If your shadows are looking choppy, your ray trace shadows, then you want to increase the, um, the rays and <clears throat> that will help smooth those out quite a bit. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to just take a moment to go into the lecture notes here. As you know, this is the one we've been doing and I wanted to just scroll down and just talk about three-point lighting a little bit. Three-point lighting is what you would use in most standard studio setups. It's a common setup that that is created for um, shooting a subject in a way that is satisfying, it looks good, and you can um, you can see every, the action very well and you can um, you know nothing is too washed out or 
messed up and it's it's aesthetically appealing so this is a good example of a subject from one light to three so this is one light primarily coming from the left side and then in this image a second light has been turned on and in this image the backlight or what they call a kick light has been turned on also sometimes called a rim light so and they made that one nice and red so you can see its effect really clearly and that's the basic three-point lighting setup is a fill light um, and then a um, backlight and a key light Oops. So I want you to read through this and create a three-point lighting setup that will um, light the subject in a way that uh, looks real and is something that that is aesthetically pleasing and doesn't leave out too much information and doesn't blow it out too much either. So. Have fun and let me know if you have any questions.